Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shane Squark, and today, on September 20th, 2013, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural webcast of the Market Technician Association's Career Development Series. The Career Development Series was developed to give the MTA membership and add whole new technical skills to develop their perfect presence. Over the course of the next few months, we plan to present you with a wide variety of topics, ranging from academic writing to harnessing social media, job advancement techniques, and even media appearances. Drawing inspiration for the once popular MTA Career Development Center, we hope that you find value in these new presentations and welcome your suggestions along the way. Today's guest is Richard Ballard, PhD, CFA, CMT, and he'll be kicking things off with Academic Publishing, How to Transition Your Work for a Practitioner Audience. Richard is Professor of Finance at the Bill Gree School of Business at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. He is the author of three books, Genetic Algorithms and Investment Strategies, Technical Market Indicators, and Technical Analysis of Gaps. He, along with Julie Dahlquist, won the MTA's Charles H. Dow Award in 2011. Richard has been a regular contributor to the MTA over the years and has helped a great deal of publications such as the Journal of Technical Analysis. Always, we welcome your questions throughout the entire webcast. In the interest of time, however, we will not be able to take your questions until the very end of the presentation. And with that said, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Mr. Richard Bauer. Okay, thank you, Shane. Um, appreciate it. Glad to be here. Uh, this is kind of an interesting topic, I think, at least for some people. I mean, it would be interesting. I don't know how broad it is, but uh, I think it's probably a good idea for almost every MTA member to be a little familiar, though, with the academic world. So even if you don't think you might be publishing, hopefully you can learn some things in what we talk about today. First off, I want to say that uh, people, of course, everyone has a different view of academia and what university looks like and what an academic setting looks like. But a lot of people have kind of a uh, glorified view. I mean, you hear the term ivory tower, of course. and uh, there's a certain amount of truth to that. Uh, however, I would say that one thing to keep in mind is the academic world is kind of strange. It's kind of an unfamiliar environment. I mean, I know some people who have gotten into academia or particularly who are coming from a practitioner world into academia and go, this, this place is weird. This is really bizarre. You also have some kind of bizarre people as well. Um, I mean, academia attracts a wide range of folks, and there are some that are pretty strange, really. So academics do tend to kind of look at things differently, and uh, some, some are very attuned to practitioner issues, some are not at all. So anyway, we'll try to go through and talk about, you know, how you might uh, target such an audience and try to get published in the academic world. First off, I'd say is to really clarify your idea or method of really spend some time, you know, thinking about exactly what it is you're trying to do, what you have in mind, on writing out, you know, write a few sentences, paragraph, spend a little time really trying to flesh out exactly what it is. Even if it's something that you've already written somewhere else, I mean, maybe you've published an article in Active Trader magazine or some other place like that and are now trying to spin it into an academic article. You still probably need to kind of think about exactly you know, what your idea is and the method is. Uh, it's easy to be, it can, it can be too broad. I mean, trying to write some article with like uh, using technical analysis to identify undervalued stocks would be rather broad. Uh, too narrow. I mean, you could be using uh, some MACD or something to uh, earn abnormal returns with trading IBM is really too narrow, uh, or being just too vague in what it is that you've you've laid out. One of the things that you'll have to do, and this is a little different than publishing, maybe for a practitioner audience. I mean, with a practitioner audience, it is good, of course, to be able to say something about or refer to previous work that's been done, but this is much more critical in an academic publication. I mean, they're going to want to see something of a literature search 
that you may have gone through and know what's done before and how your work fits in to the body of literature that's already there. And when I say literature search here, I'm really talking about academic publications. I mean, it's certainly it would be good to reference anything that's been written in a more of a practitioner publication, but uh, you definitely want to make sure that there's nothing that's been done uh, like this already in the academic world and that you've referenced that. Uh, another reason, and maybe touch on this a little bit later, but another reason for doing that also is that when you send it off to be reviewed, the reviewer, there's a good chance the reviewer will send it to someone who's done work in the area, since the reviewer would, editor would consider, I'm sorry, the editor would send it off to me to review who's done some work in the area since they would be familiar with the area. So if you have uh, omitted someone's work in the area who ends up getting uh, sent your paper to review, they're not going to be too happy that you haven't referenced their work. So doing that is, is definitely something that uh, has to be done. There are a number of online databases now that you may be able to access through public library. I mean, some public libraries have it where you can log in remotely and and access various databases. Certainly, universities have that a lot. So, I mean, I can log in at St. Mary's University. I can log into our library or go into our library and um, access a wide variety of electronic databases. One is Business Source. Business Source um, basically references almost all academic journals in business and then even some some practitioner or trade publications as well. So searching in business source is a, is a really good place to start. And you're going to probably pick up most, almost everything that's going to be written that's relevant to your topic that's been published in the academic world is going to be, be in there. Uh, you may have to play around with search terms, and it's got some interesting things if you can uh, click into and look at uh, bibliographies then from other other people who've written the area and kind of look at their bibliography and see, you know, maybe there's some things in there that are uh, would be not pick exactly in the search term you used, but would be relevant. In terms of journals itself, there's a publication called Cabell's, which again, if you can get access to it, a lot of universities. Uh, business schools would be interested in having this available to their faculty. And Cabell's is a directory of academic journals in business. So you can search it, uh, you can look at finance journals and uh, do various uh, screens, filters, different ways, but it, it is a very comprehensive list. And in fact, in the academic world, if it's, if it's not listed in Cabell's, um, that's generally not well received within the academic community. I mean, when people are looking at promotion and tenure decisions and your dean is looking at what you've done and stuff, I mean, they want to kind of see that it's listed in Capels and maybe have pulled some information from it, particularly concerning acceptance rate. So acceptance rate, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, there's different ways that you might actually calculate it, and I don't know exactly how they do because you end up having a lot of resubmissions and stuff and different journals might do it differently. But generally a low acceptance rate is considered good. You know, that's an indication of the quality of the journal. Uh, not always, but uh, certainly as kind of a general rule, I'd say lower acceptance rate tends to be viewed more favorably by academics. So in some of the top journals, it may be five, 10% or so acceptance rate, uh, quite low. The review process itself, generally the way it works is that you would write your article, you would send it off to a, the editor of the journal, and they would then look at it and decide who to send it out to for review. And what in the academic world, what like is what's called a blind review, where the reviewer does not know 
who wrote the article so that when you submit copies to the editor, of course nowadays a lot of, most things are done electronically and you submit electronic copy, but in your electronic copy you would have strip off your the name, your name and your affiliation and anything that identifies you. Now that a number of times you can, and I've gotten articles that I have reviewed for journals where sometimes it's fairly easy to figure out who the author probably is because if he has some other stuff and is referencing that in their paper, then you probably put two and two together and say, well, you know, it sounds like kind of a continuation of some of their line of work and they probably wrote it. But theoretically, it is a review, a blind review. Some of the editors tend to say, oh, we have no power because we sent it out for blind review and, you know, we don't have any influence on that. Well, that's true to an extent, but there's also, they do have a lot of discretion in who they send it out to for review. So they do have some power in the process for sure, I would say. So they send it out for review, uh, maybe to two, typically might be two reviews, two reviewers. So they would send it out and <clears throat> then the reviewer would get the article and read through it and make comments. They may have a form that they use. Uh, sometimes, I mean, there's a certain questions or form that they might use that they send to the reviewers to address. Other times, it's very open-ended that you just, you know, write up your comments as a reviewer, <clears throat> which can vary a lot in terms of detail. This is not a quick process by any means. It is um, <clears throat> not unusual once you send something off to an editor and it, you should get an art, something back from them saying that they received it and sent it out for review. But then past that, it could easily be two, three, four, five, six, even more months before you hear from them. And part of that is just that people are busy. You know, if I get an article review, it comes in and maybe I've got a lot of other things going on at the time. and. Maybe it's a couple of weeks before I can get to it. So it's it's generally kind of a slow process. I mean, most people, I'd say from a practitioner point of view, would say, wow, this, is, <clears throat> this takes forever. So actually, most things that you see published in the academic world are probably, possibly at least a year old um, because the original research may have been done and then it was sent off for review and maybe it was rejected by a journal initially and they sent it to another journal. and so the whole process can take quite a while. Now, in the world of technical analysis, uh, the MTA has the Journal of Technical Analysis, which is um, certainly, I would say, the premier journal in technical analysis. I mean, if, we, if you're in the MTA, it would be obviously a great place to publish. If you go to the MTA's website where they uh, the page for the Journal of Technical Analysis, you will see a description, a little bit of the journal and what they're looking for. On the right-hand side there, you see archives in PDF format. You may notice that there's a break in there. There's 2009 and then there wasn't anything until 2013. And the journal did kind of go on hiatus for a while um, there for various reasons, but um, it is active now. There was an issue that was published recently. Uh, full disclosure here, my wife is Julie Dahlquist, who I have published books with and journal articles with, and Julie is the, the journal editor now for the Journal of Technical Analysis, so I'm pretty familiar with this. I know she's looking for articles, very much so, and so would really like people to be contributing articles. and. We'll try to work with someone um, if they send something that's not really, that needs a lot of work or something before it could really be seriously considered for publication, you know, she will try to work with you on that and is quite interested in receiving uh, submissions. At the, uh, this is a slide showing the bottom of that same page and and th this is typical too of any journal that you might go to where they will have a se section in there that's submission information for authors. So they will tell you, you know, we want it in this font, this um, the, this number of 
number of copies we want, and various things like that, and uh, whatever else they have in terms of submission information. So whatever journal you might be thinking about, you would want to look at that and see. You might also want, if they have guidelines for reviewers, which uh, Journal of Technical Analysis does, it's certainly well worth looking at that because that's obviously what the, you know, the reviewers are criteria and things that they're going to be looking at as they review your paper. Um, the Journal of Technical Analysis is a blind reviewed journal, um, I think two blind reviews, and so it's pretty typical in terms of um, an academic type journal. Uh, it does target, of course, um, the papers, some are more practitioner oriented, but uh, well, they all should have some more practical application to them, <clears throat> but you know, they do hold it to a high degree of rigor in terms of uh, what they publish. Now, in the world of finance, certainly the Journal of Finance in the academic world would be the pinnacle published by the American Finance Association. Publishing in finance in academia is extremely competitive. Uh, I've seen an article or somewhere I saw something about the average time that is put into a Journal of Finance article. It's like three to 500 man hours. I mean, it takes a lot. Um, it's just a long process. People maybe sit a paper at a small meeting and get feedback and then they go back to the drawing board and rework it and rework it and you know, then it goes through multiple uh, reviews and submissions and so forth and it's just a long road and in a top journal like that one of the problems you're going to have is you are going to have to dot every I and every T. I mean it is going to have to be super 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 clean in terms of statistical methodology and uh, the data that you've used and so forth. So uh, I mean I've never worked Journal of Finance and really don't even plan to. I mean, I can't imagine anything that I would write that would <clears throat> go to someplace like that. Um, so there's a huge, so that's the top. Uh, journal investing is certainly be a strong journal and well respected. Uh, it is more pragmatic oriented and not quite as same level of academic rigor maybe as the Journal of Finance. A lot of times people when they write, an academic who writes in our it's more prestigious. Uh, the stronger the journal you can publish in, the better. So they'll have some schools have rankings of this is an a, this is our list of A journals, B journals, C journals, and so forth. So what a lot of times what people will do is they'll send the article initially to the highest journal that they think they have any shot at getting in at all, and then if it's rejected there, then they submit it somewhere else. You're only supposed to have it. Um, submitted one place at a time. It's <clears throat> not good if you try to you know, send it to multiple journals. Because the academic world is, is different, um, different animal, I would say that you might want to consider getting a co-author. And this is a little tricky. I mean, it, I mean, maybe you know somebody, maybe you don't. If you know somebody uh, you can, who's an academic in finance, I mean, just talk to them about it and see if they might have some interest in working with you. If you don't know someone, um, that does get a little trickier. The academic world in finance is generally not real receptive to technical analysis. Uh, I want to kind of make you aware of that. In the 70s and 80s, there was a bunch of research done in finance that kind of hammered technical analysis pretty hard and basically said that uh, markets are what they call efficient, that markets factor all that in, and that looking at any past price and volume information, uh, you're not going to earn any abnormal returns. And so they had a pretty negative view of technical analysis. They even had a pretty negative view at, of fundamental analysis as well, of saying that that also was not really, that the search for undervalued and overvalued securities was basically kind of a fruitless expedition. And the markets were efficient. Markets processed information very process markets very information very quickly and efficiently, and all that's uh, impounded in the price very quickly. So again, a lot of academics kind of view technical analysis with some criticism. However, I will say that that has changed 
a, a good bit in the last 10 years or so. There has been more receptivity to, to technical analysis among academics, and I've seen more um, more work being done in that area. But still, it's it's in the minority. And so, if you're um, in terms of co-author, you'd have to find somebody who, who's receptive to that, and uh, that may not be the easiest thing to do. But you know, one thing you might do is go to some ac academic meetings, and if there's some nearby or something that you can go to and attend and uh, <clears throat> see some of the presentations that are made and you know maybe uh, maybe at coffee or break or whatever you you know strike up a conversation with somebody who presented and tell them what you're doing and tell them what your interest is and so sometimes you can end up co-authoring with somebody that you know prior to something like that uh, they didn't know you you didn't know them and and a number of academics, I mean, academics want to publish. So, I mean, if they feel like you've got something that could help lead them to a publication, they're, you know, a lot of them are going to be receptive to that. Now, uh, you need to think about what data you're going to use, time, time period. I mean, some of the things that academics are going to think about is, is if you're doing some testing of some trading methodology, <clears throat> is this something that encompasses a broad enough time period, you know, or is it something that might strictly be working, you know, be be work, working under only under bull market conditions? So, have you allowed for bull and bear market conditions? You know, is the time period broad enough, really, that it has encompassed enough? Um, another thing would be, you know, what have you included in the way of stocks or securities? The breadth of sample. <clears throat> I mean, is this something that you're showing that it seems to work for two or three or four stocks or even 10, academics are going to view that very skeptically. I mean, they're going to look at things as well. You know, you can always go back after the fact and pull out some things that have worked on some small subset. So, so do you have an breadth of sample? Um, you get into a lot of very difficult issues to handle in terms of dotting I's and crossing T's because, for example, if you were trying to go back and compare performance to the S&P 500, well, the S&P 500 stocks change on a regular basis. So have you accounted for that? I mean, in other words, if you're saying the performance was such and such in 2010 and you're somehow adjusting for what was going on with the market um, with the S&P 500 at that time, were you using what was really in existence in the S&P 500 at that time, or were you using you know, the stocks that are in there today, which is a different set? So there's, again, there's a lot of denies and crossing of T's um, that you know, may be required that is difficult. Another important issue certainly for academics is risk adjustment. Just because you say, here, here's some method I have, and you know, it seems to make lots of gains, and this is, this is great, you know, and I've proved the technical analysis works. One of the first questions somebody's trained in uh, academic finance is going to ask is, well, what kind of risk adjustment have they used? Have they taken into account uh, what the market was doing? So a simple risk adjustment would be to subtract what returns were in the S&P 500 over that same time period. That would be a very simple risk adjustment. A slightly more advanced method would be to use the capital asset pricing model. If you've heard of the CAPM or capital asset pricing model, it uses a thing called beta as a measure of systematic risk. And so generally you would expect higher beta stocks to have higher returns. So the question there becomes, well, you know, you're showing higher returns, and yes, you beat the market, but a market average beta would be one. So, you know, are you have the stocks that you've pulled out and that you're showing that this works for, is that a beta 1.2 or 1.3 sample that you've somehow, you know, there's kind of a bias in your method that leans toward higher risk stocks. So anemics are going to want to see risk adjustment and and that's that's a very difficult issue because 
the cap in. Uh, there's lots of rocks that have been thrown at the cap in, and you know, there's various ways you can do risk adjustment. I mean, that's a very complex topic in itself. So, but that is something that you're going to need to address um, for sure. Typical structure of an article. Typically, you would have a brief introduction, a paragraph or so, and or two maybe, and talk about you know what it is, give the overview of what it is you're doing. Then you would have a detailed literature review, and again, you really need to reference any, certainly any major thing that touches on the work that you've done needs to be referenced in there, and then to show how what you're doing builds upon the existing literature, that you're taking it a step further, that you're adding something new, and either in terms of, it could be new in terms of methodology, I mean, sometimes somebody will investigate the same basic issue, but is using different methodology. For example, in the academic uh, journals, you might have somebody who uses different risk, risk adjustment and attacks the risk adjustment that somebody used in a previous article and say, well, we've got a better method for adjusting for risk now. And so they revisit the same basic issue, but with slightly different methodology. Or it could be different data. Uh, as well, but anyway, you're having to you know, show how yours fits in. And again, you want to make sure that you don't leave stuff out, important articles, because it could be the person who's reviewing your article and you don't want to show that you have ignored their work. Then you describe data that you've used, and describe the methodology, whatever statistical tests you might be doing, and that kind of thing. Then go into a discussion of results and then have a conclusion of you know, what does all this mean at the end, uh, including possibly avenues for further research. Also, maybe acknowledging some weaknesses in what you've done, some limit, limitations, I might say. It's probably a better word than weaknesses, but limitations of saying, well, you know, yes, we did this with this sample of data and all. It would be nice to do it with you know, sample or whatever. Or, but somehow kind of acknowledge some of the limitations maybe in what you can do. So you need to be careful about conclusions. You need to be careful in general in an academic article. Anything that is really opinion, I mean, the academics are going to go, is this opinion or you know, can they back it up with fact? You don't want to state anything. You really have to kind of state things somewhat tentatively and very carefully. So you don't want to make kind of bold statements uh, in something you're writing for academia. You want to be sure that you kind of couch it very specifically of what, you know, really what hard conclusions can be drawn from this. And then, of course, a bibliography listing uh, all of the stuff that you've referenced and, uh, and then any tables or figures as well, which <clears throat> tables and figures, I mean, uh, almost every thing you would do in finance would have some either tables or figures. And one of the things that uh, I find helpful is try to begin with the end in mind in terms of thinking about what ultimately are you going to have there in terms of tables or figures um, in terms of presenting your results. So as you kind of think about it's good to think about that on the front end because you can you can save yourself a lot of time, particularly if you're doing something in Excel, for example, uh, of kind of thinking about where you're headed at the end and what you're ultimately trying to produce here as uh, output in terms of a table or figure is is good to know at the outset and can save you save you a lot of work. Okay. Uh, next thing here is writing your paper. Now, the things I'm going to talk about here really apply, I would say, very generally. I mean, not just academia, but anything anybody writes. When I get a paper from a student, one of the things I try to identify is if it, there's problems in the writing, which these days <laughs> there's almost invariably problems, believe me. Uh, there's very few things I get submitted to me that are what I would consider to be well written. But one of the things that I kind of look look at is, you know, exactly what am I having problems with in terms of their writing? Where is the weakness? And 
So is it a macro structure issue or a microstructure issue? Now macro structure would be the overall outline of you know what is the logical flow, the outline of everything in the paper of how it's structured. And so you want to think about that again at the very start, think about that of what is your overall outline of what it is you're doing. Another thing that I find that very useful to do is topic sentences. The uh, books that I've been involved in writing, I have, uh, I know the first book I wrote by myself, and one of the things I did was I sat down and wrote a topic sentence for every single paragraph in the entire book. I mean, I laid out the outline and then I wrote down topic sentences. I mean, the old rule, it doesn't mean that that sentence has to be the first sentence in the paragraph, but that's not a bad rule, really, but, but at least having where you've got kind of a coherent paragraph that you're going to be working with. And I find that if you do a good job, if you do a good job of the macro structure, if you have a good outline and you have and you sit down and take the trouble to write out topic sentences, the rest of the writing becomes very easy because it's it's um, almost kind of like a paragraph writes itself. I mean, if you know your stuff, um, it's not easy to kind of I mean, it's not hard to build on a good topic sentence. Uh, sentence structure, obviously, kind of avoid you know, things that get too complex, kind of vary things. Decide passive versus active voice. One of the things, particularly in academia, is that years ago, everything was written in a passive voice. And now, uh, some journals still like that. Some now are okay with an active voice, but you need to look at the journal in question and look at the um, look at the guidelines for the author, authors and see what they might have to say about that. Also decide on tense. Um, are you going to talk about it in the past or are you going to talk about it in the present? And be careful about that in when you write the paper. Are you being consistent? You know, because if you say, you know, we will look at this or, you know, now we're going to look at this, but it's stuff that you've already done. I mean, it's so then it would be past tense, but being consistent with however you're presenting things. Uh, word choice and usage is another level then of kind of macro microstructure of have you really used the right word. Again, I would be very careful. Um, words and nuances, I mean, uh, in an academic paper, they're going to look at every every word. I mean, if you use something that just has a slightly uh, more a tone to it that's more opinionated maybe than really kind of couching it in this is kind of a seems to be a conclusion, tentative conclusion or whatever that you're stating as fact or something um, that might might well um, raise some concern or whatever. So so word choice is important. One of my favorite stories about editing is you may be familiar, most people are familiar with Charlotte's Web children's book, which was written by E. B. White. What some people don't know is that E.B. White was probably the premier essayist in the United States for quite a while and wrote for the New Yorker magazine, which has high, high, high standards in terms of the writing. White wrote an, a letter to one of his friends one time, and at the end of the letter he said, I apologize for the length of this letter, but I didn't have time to write a shorter one. So emphasizing editing. I mean, Light in his work, in his essays, he would go over for months and had the idea that every single word had to be in there for a purpose. I mean, he tried to trim everything down uh, and say everything as succinctly and all as he possibly could. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, you would have to go to that level in what we're talking about here, but still, um, you don't, it's a good idea to, to write, you know, write a draft, go back and edit it and rewrite it and maybe go through two or three rewrites in getting to a final form. I would read through it, um, maybe even read through it aloud or have some, certainly have somebody else listen, read through it, but really listen to what you've said. Is it clear? 
obviously spell check is incorrect on misspelled words. Uh, one of the things that spell check can't catch is homonyms like T H E I R versus T H E R E. So if you make a mistake with something like that, it's going to go through spell check, but uh, is obviously um, you, you maybe used it incorrectly. So you need to be careful about that. I would say have someone else read your paper, particularly uh, particularly if you don't think writing is you know your real strong sh suit is to have somebody else read it, and ideally have somebody who would be maybe attuned to academic type writing. Just check and recheck everything. One of the things you want to do is that when you send something off, you don't want to give them any reason to reject it. Everything you know should be as clean as possible. Do do not send it off thinking well, or, you know, the idea in your head of well, I know I really need to fix this or whatever. This you know this really could use a little more work. These you know could be done a little better or whatever. I mean, if you think that, you need to fix it and fix it before you send it, and make sure that everything is you know as clean as possible. Again, you don't want to give them a reason to reject. So at this point, you know, you've done all those things, you're submitting your paper, you review the guidelines again. I mean, again, go back and make sure that have I done everything you know, that they say to do. And, and this too is particularly important if you end up getting rejected from one journal and then end up sending to another. Well, there may be some slight differences in terms of the guidelines that they give authors and what font they want or how they want the figures or tables or that kind of thing. So making sure that it's consistent with what the journal is expecting. Have a good cover letter um, that accompanies it or of course sometimes now this is done via email, but have have a good cover to the editor. Uh, I mean it doesn't have to be long, but just you know tell them that you're submitting this, you know, and and all and kind of briefly lay out what it's about and uh, and then send that off and then wait. <laughs> so you're waiting at that point, uh, again, possibly for months and months, uh, hopefully not, but it could be a long time. You are, invariably, you will be rejected. I mean, I know I, I don't know that I can even think of anyone in the academic world who has sent a paper off to an academic publication and had them come back and say, yeah, it's accepted, we're going to sit in, you know, the next issue or, you know, issue three months or whatever. I don't think I've ever heard that. I mean, they're they are going to find something. I mean, the reviewers, the editors, somebody in there is going to find something to take issue with. I mean, I guarantee you there's going to be something that, that they don't like. It could be the data, it could be the methodology, it could be the way you've stated something. I mean, so it could be something more just editorial in terms of how you've written it, but it could be something more substantive in terms of the methodology that you've used. For example, risk. Maybe you haven't um, haven't addressed that adequately. It's easy to get discouraged. I mean, it's no fun. Nobody likes getting rejections. So, but uh, just kind of expect it and be ready for it. Now, kind of the best you can hope for is what's called a revise and resubmit. So that would be where the editor comes back to you and says, well, you know, your paper seems to be acceptable and on target or whatever for the journal, uh, but, you know, the following things need to be done, you know, please make these changes and then resubmit your paper. Now, academics will kind of parse over that language really looking for nuances because exactly how how encouraging are they being in, in the revise and resubmit. I mean, if, and of course some of them will, will not give you that option at all. I mean, it's just flat out rejected. And so, and if they do say revise and re resubmit, I mean, some of them may be, it may be pretty onerous stuff that they're asking you to do and they know the chances of you doing it are probably pretty small. So, it could be a pretty, almost a rejection in the revise and resubmit, but you want to look at that closely. Uh, again, don't get discouraged. I mean, it may, 
you know, it may take going back to the drawing board is something that could take you two or three months to work out and and get it, you know, up to snuff. But make sure you address every single thing. I mean, you want to make a list, write it down, and make sure that every single one of those things um, <clears throat> has been has been addressed. Um, okay, I know I've probably been negative. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things I've said that are probably discouraging to somebody if you're thinking about um, writing. You may have listened. What I've said you go through, and some of the past probably that you have you have done that. Um, so anyway, with that said, I'll start uh, moving to see some of the questions and uh, see what I can do with that. Okay. Um, some question. Uh, here's one on: Are there any tips you've that you use to draw inspiration for topic selection. Um, reading, reading what other people have done, I mean, just the more that you're aware of things that have been done, a lot of times I, I will get our ideas out of that, of going, well, you know, they looked at this or that, but, you know, what about this other angle to it? Um, or or another thing you can do is use, again, different data, different methodology. I mean, maybe if you see something that's been published and it's uh, used U.S. data, if you happen to have access to some data in another country and can kind of spin it out into into that uh, avenue to say, well, you know, how does this work in Japan or Europe or whatever would be a way. Um, as you're as you're reading, I think you do get ideas. I mean, one of the things, particularly in a PhD, is people sometimes say, well, how do you get an idea for a dissertation? Well, you read plenty of stuff in a doctoral program, and and out of that, you know, you'll get ideas. So, I mean, I don't know. The best advice I can get is just to be on that one, I think, is just to kind of be up on stuff as much as you can and kind of think critically about um, what you see. How frequently do you find yourself publishing new materials? Well, uh, that one's kind of interesting right now for me. Uh, my wife, Julie Dahlquist, and I have have a regular article now in Active Trader Magazine. Now, of course, this is a practitioner-oriented publication, trade-type publication. So we have a deal with them right now that we have kind of a monthly column. And what Julie and I do is we alternate is that she does one and I do one and we just alternate back and forth. Um, so I've been publishing in there now, you know, every other month in that publication, which I will say has been more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I mean, initially you come in and you've got several ideas that you think are fairly good and then and now at this point that I've published six or seven articles for them, I've kind of lost track of exactly where I am at this point, but, um, you know, things are getting a little more difficult in terms of articles. Now, in terms of academic publications, uh, St. Mary's University, where I teach, is much more teaching-oriented and is more pragmatic and in our, in our orientation as opposed to kind of more of a pure research kind of school. Um, and so our guideline in the business school is that we have to publish three academic, blind refereed journal articles within a five-year window. So we're supposed to maintain a five-year window that we've got three 
three articles in the past five years that have been published in academic uh, peer-reviewed academic wine review publications. And, um, and and that's you know frankly that's not easy to do in finance. I mean finance does is rigorous. Um, I have colleagues who publish in other areas of management or entrepreneurship or something, and I look at some of the things that are published in those journals, and I go, my gosh, I can't even think of a single finance journal that would take this. Uh, so it is fairly rigorous, um, but you know there is a, certainly a hierarchy. There's some uh, journals out there that don't require near as much that would be uh, possibilities. But anyway, that's kind of so. You know, I, I'm shooting for about you know three every five years. Other universities would have more more uh, onerous requirements. Um, I mean, if you're working in the business, and I mean, if you, if you could publish one thing in active journal, academic journal in your lifetime, that might be a great achievement. I mean, it's uh, so. But in terms of me, you know, that's um, I'm under kind of different requirements of different situations since I am in that world. Uh, there's a question on where where do you see technical analysis going, more quantitative? I would say probably so. Um, I mean, w one of the things that I have found discouraging about the academic world of finance in general is that it has been um, I look at some of the things that are published and even in some of the top journals and I say, why would anybody even care about this? I mean, it seems to have no practical value. Why would anybody care about it? And and I understand, you know, the whole notion of kind of pure research and some ideas that might be developed at the time that, uh, you know, you, you develop some idea or concept or method or whatever that doesn't seem to have practical application at the time but ends up being more practical. I, I get that, but still I look at some stuff and I go, well, I don't think it's even, it, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, I just think it's something that's just some narrow nitpicking thing that academics are hung up about that really doesn't have any practical value. So in general, finance itself has been very, very quantitative. I mean, the academic world, PhDs in finance right now, you've got to know one heck of a lot of math and statistics. I mean, that's that's what people are doing. Now, there has been, that said, I would say that there has been a little bit of backing off of that in that there has been a little more recognition of maybe, you know, hey, we do need to be more relevant, more practical. So it, it's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, technical analysis, I'd say by its nature, is going to be pretty quantitative. I mean, anything you publish there is, I mean, you're going to have to be doing some statistical tests and stuff that, and ha have quantitative analysis. I mean, just to to qualitatively say some stuff about it or whatever's not going to cut it. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think probably more quantitative is. Um, I mean, in technical analysis itself, I think in terms of publishing anything, yes, you're going to need to be pretty quantitative in, in the academic world for sure. I don't know if that answers it exactly, but anyway, that's kind of my best shot right now. Um, question, you mentioned that Julie was looking for writers for the Journal of Technical Analysis. Uh, yes, she very much is. Um, What's the process involved in submitting articles? Is it very selective? Is it limited to specific topics at each issue? Um, okay, submitting, I mean, just look at the submission requirements for authors and all, and that'll be out, you know, what they're, what you will have to do there um, and send it off, you know, you'll send it off to her and then she will uh, identify, you know, pick out some people to review the article and uh, send it off for review and then you know, wait to hear back from them and then see where things go from there. Is it very selective? Uh, yes, it's, I mean, it's not, it, it, I don't know what her, what the acceptance rate is right now, but I mean, it's certainly no slam dunk. I mean, it's, it's a solid journal. I mean, what, 
what Julie's really much trying to do, I would say, the journal is she really does want it to be practitioner oriented and practical, pragmatic, not publishing something that's, you know, just abstract and all and not uh, really very useful. But at the same time, it needs to be done in a rigorous kind of way. So, and, and finding that balance is, is not easy. So it's um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's kind of my thought there. So I mean, it is it is selective. Yes, I mean it's um, you know you are going to have to uh, have some solid work. It needs to be well written. I mean, you know, one of the things that is a problem I know, and that uh, I, she's told me she's gotten some things that you know are, are just poorly written. Now, if that that's an easier thing to fix in the sense that if somebody's done something that seems to have value and seems to have solid work to it, but is just not well written, I mean, those are some things that are fairly easy to fix in a, in a way. I mean, that's easier to fix than something that's just fundamentally flawed. Um, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so anyway, make sure that you know have somebody else look it over and make sure it is well written and readable. I mean, again, she wants it to be, <clears throat> excuse me, readable for a practitioner audience, and so you know, have it where it's solid academically I and mean, solid methodology and research and all that's gone into it. But at the same time, you know, is readable. Uh, is it limited to specific topics each issue? Uh, no, she hasn't done that. I mean, some journals do sometimes uh, set up, um, you know, where they'll have uh, selected topics, you know, and devote a journal issue to particular topics. And they have not done that um, to, uh, unless they did it years ago in journal or technical analysis. I mean, to my knowledge, they haven't done that. So she's kind of open to anything. So. Um, and and she would be open too, I'm sure, to sending her an email with an idea. I mean, if you and and I think more approachable than a lot of editors might be about something like that. I mean, some editors are okay with that, some some not. But I mean, I think if you've got an idea that you're thinking about, um, just go ahead and bounce it off her and um, see what you know. And she'll give you some feedback and suggestions and. You can kind of go from there. So that's um, that's I guess a list of questions that have come in, and um, I hope hope you've gotten something out of this one way or another. And if you if I can be of help to you, uh, feel free to uh, email me um, rbauer at stmarytx.edu. I mean, you can find me on the web easily with my email address. Um, so, I mean, if I can be of help, I'd be glad to throw in my two cents on on whatever. So, um, you know, I've had some reservations about doing this in the sense that I feel like it's important for people to understand the playing field and understand the game and understand the difficulty difficulties involved in as a Put this together, and as I've talked through this uh, today, you know, you know, I've gone well. Have I just been negative in a lot of things of all the hurdles that are faced? That it's you know just kind of depressing and daunting to somebody listening to all this. Um, and but it, but you need to go in with your eyes open. You need to kind of understand you know what what all is involved. But again, that said, I mean it is publishing anywhere is an extremely satisfying thing to do and I would certainly um, certainly encourage you if you've if you've got any thoughts at all about doing this, I mean if this holds any intrigue to you at all, that probably says something right there. I mean, because a lot of people would not have that. So just the fact that you're thinking about it at all, I would say says something about you. So so anyway, that's it for today, and thank you very much. Appreciate your interest and appreciate the questions I got. Thank you.
And I'd like to thank you, Richard. That was an excellent and extremely informative presentation. I think one of the biggest questions, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the biggest questions we get in the MTA is it pertains to kind of putting technical knowledge to work. It's always about the writing and the publishing process and kind of how to go about that. So um, please know for everyone listening out there that we do a full team of volunteers on both the technically speaking e newsletter and in the Journal of Technical Analysis staff, um, which is led by Richard's wife, Julie Quist, uh, that are always available to help you fine tune your writing. Uh, it's a great way to get some constructive feedback that you're still publishing a really professional uh, and well-written magazine. Uh, so that does wrap up today's career development series. I hope you all enjoyed the first. We'll promise to be many more career-oriented webs. Uh, again, we do welcome your feedback and any requests you want on what you'd like to see in this new series. So feel free to email those directly to me at shane at mta.org. For the Market Technicians Association, I'm Shane Squark. I thank you for joining us today, and I hope you all have a very wonderful weekend. So long, everybody.